Thank you. Um, the topic that I have is really about training teams, but it's really applicable to anything that you might have. You could have compensation teams that are fairly local or regional and need to move them over to a global structure. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is my own journey over the last three years. I took over a training organization that was very regional. And it was well regarded in those regions. But in order to get to where we wanted to go and be really meaningful and finally measure our results in a global way, we had to transform ourselves into a global organization. And I imagine that many of you are in that same spot trying to figure out to what degree to be global, what degree to be regional. And so I'm going to walk you through just kind of some highlights, uh, purposely keeping it uh, somewhat generic. Uh, and the first thing I want to talk about is that it wasn't a bad thing. You know, regional teams offer a lot that is really valued. And um, one, they, are, they have a lot of knowledge, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, they, they know their regions. They know their business. They've got a context for who those business leaders are and how they came there. They can be very responsive. Someone can read a great leadership book, come into the office, ask that local trainer to do something, and they can respond. And finally, they can customize any number of things. So the teams that I took over were well regarded. But what's not so great about uh, regional teams is when you're trying to go global and you've got a global strategy, then everything differs. And so at one point, I was leading HR for a global business unit and kind of said, well, what's available as I look to make a plan for you know, all of my 3,000 leaders? And the answer was, well, tell me what region or tell me what city, and I'll tell you what's available. And so it really gets hard if you're trying to do things globally and you've got regional training teams. It's, it's very difficult to figure out what you're going to do to really grow your leadership as you look around the globe. And so our offers, uh, our offerings, our classes, uh, and other training and development related things really varied by region, which was an issue. The standards vary. Some of them were good. Some of them were not so good. And then it wasn't really business unit wise. So you know, my main point is that if your business units are global, your training organization really needs to be global as well. And finally, the customization limits reusability. Uh, one of the things I did three years ago was just look at what we have and take a big inventory. And so you, uh, I, I wanted, at first I thought, well, there are so many great titles. Um, let's go ahead and, and see. And there were so many great titles, but right behind that was a quick and dirty training project where someone said, you know, it was good. I wanted to tell you I did it in about a month's time, so it's nothing really that you could use globally. And so I had a lot of great titles. I had maybe 15 different types of presentation skills course, for example, but probably not one that would really leverage into something you'd want to share globally and you'd want to replicate. So if your business unit is global, then really your HR strategy uh, needs to be global. And so certainly the training that I have in leadership development really needed to be global. Um, Dell is a global organization, 100,000 people, over 100,000. About 10,000 of those are leaders. And so when we say as part of our strategy, we've defined a people strategy. And one of those parts of people strategy is inspiring leadership. So we, we say something about what leadership means. And we've defined it. And so we then need to support it. So how are we training our leaders to really meet that standard of inspiring leadership? And if we're saying it's global, you get this kind of good leader wherever you are in the world. What are we doing to make sure that when our people get promoted or when they get hired in as a leader, we're really supporting that leader and, and uh, doing those behaviors as we've defined it? So you know, why global? It's tied to company strategy, aligned to corporate culture, using the same language. Uh, speaking to the same behaviors, how you want people to feel as they you know, contribute to Dell. And then you create it once. Uh, we had lots of overlap and not necessarily things that we could reuse. So the idea is if we went global, we would all collaborate together on one version of an entry level program or one version of a mid-level manager program or one level of a director program. Once you're able to do that, you can get buy-in at senior levels. And that was really important because until I was global, I wasn't able to do that. Uh, and then finally, you can really strengthen the impact of your training. We've been able to measure our training globally. And I'll talk a little bit about that, about that at the end. But that's re the real power is to be able to say globally, here's how we have impacted our leaders around the world. 
Um, you know, if I had to take a look at the three-year journey, uh, kind of beginning to end, the beginning was really creating a vision. And I won't tell you that this was easy because people were very valued by their local offices. So certainly as far as change management, there was a bit of loss involved in that I know I'm going to be valued in the future, but we really had to paint a picture that if we could collaborate across our four regions in the world and come to a global curriculum, then we could begin saying that our entry level program, we could create one that we all collaborated on and have it be required so that when people got promoted, and this is what we do today, the very next month they're included and they are invited to a mandatory program. But it really helps they attend a kickoff with other managers who are newly promoted. They enter into a cohort, which lasts several months, several virtual meetings. Executives come in and talk to the cohort of newly promoted managers. And then we have a capstone. And so they're with a group of other newly promoted leaders. And we do this around the world. And so. In order to get there, though, we had to create this vision. And it was a stretch. Some people were very tied to their local programs, so especially if they wrote them themselves, which is natural. But we had to say, once we have something like that in place, we can get it required so that you're not out there alone trying to get leaders into leadership training, but you know that everybody is doing this all over the world, and you're part of something bigger. So you know, together um, on the next step being global is really um, together building a common global program. So we were able to do that with our Foundations of Leadership program that I just described. And then later, as a second wave, we're able to take our mid-level programs, leader workshops, and able to make those global. We're three years out, and so the final um, step is both global and local. We finally have a pretty good menu of things that we have as global offerings. And now we're able to say, when you go and you work with your local talent, either in the region or in your office, you can pick out of this menu. So if you've got a group of pipeline talent, you can say, well, let's go ahead and put them through these things off of our global menu. And let's go ahead and, and do some of the other things, like involve some of our local leaders. But you can also say, if it picks up and it's a success and you want to do it globally, you can do that if everyone's selecting things off of a global menu. And that's what we've been able to do, is really finally partner at a global business unit and still have a nice mix of what's available locally. Um, you know, so, so keeping that in mind, painting a vision, creating global programs together, and then actually working with local leaders to you know, focus on their pipeline talent using some global solutions. How do you get there? And so really four things that we really focused on was common standards. Our courses didn't look alike. They weren't necessarily taught alike in any number of things. Global processes, global teams, and finally, you know, really taking those best practices. So I'll talk a little bit about each one. Um, building the future, we created some common standards. Um, and it sounds simple, but it's not, because if you take a group of trainers, they all have a good idea of what even a good class looks like, or what a good participant manual, or a facilitator's manual, or a simulation. And so what we did is we talked about it generically, but there's nothing like building a program with a real deadline. And when we got together, we had a global process of, you know, we, we all talk in training about the ADDIE model. Um, but it's, it's used differently. So to talk about what kind of activities we agree would take place in analysis, what a good design document looks like, how we're going to develop together, and then actually how we're going to implement and test, do that train the trainer. It sounds very simple, but when you're doing it all over the world at the same time, we also made a decision early on that we would not just pilot in the US and then ship it over, that we would do global pilots. And that was really, um, very important for us because then it equalized all regions so that there's a tendency to do wherever your headquarters is first and then ship it out second. And so that was a big part is just establishing that global process. The, the third item is creating global teams. When we had four regional teams, people knew that there were other training teams certainly, but they didn't know them by name. And so when we said, well, let's go ahead and collaborate on a Foundations of Leadership program, a you know, three-month cohort-based program, then we actually made sure that every single aspect of that team had a member from all four regions. 
Um, one, I will tell you for people outside the United States, they were really pleased about a year afterwards. People said, my English proficiency has never been higher, and it's something I've always wanted to do. I've taken English lessons for years, and now I can honestly say I can converse, I can think, and my writing skills. So for some of the people who, you know, that was important, uh, that was a real skill builder for them. And just the personal satisfaction of knowing someone who does your job in France and how it is to have hear them about how they, uh, one, take their long vacations, but how they get their kids off for school, where they go, how they do any number of things. And so it's really been very good for us. I will tell you that not everybody bought in. Um, very often, we're, we're based in headquarters. Uh, our headquarters, rather, is based here in Texas. And so for our APJ team, this, this meant more evening hours. And some of the people really said, look, I, I don't have the connectivity at home. I, I'm, I really don't want to spend some evening hours. And I can see that this global role is going to mean more evening hours. What we've tried to do is consolidate so that maybe all of the evening hours might take place on a Tuesday. So we accept that one of your evenings may be blown, but we're not going to blow the whole week for you. And so we've, we've learned how to kind of compensate um, and then um, that's been that's been very satisfying and then finally the best practices you know some of the regions had some really nice work and we made sure that as part of our analysis we went the extra mile to survey what everybody had done because we recognized we weren't starting from scratch and so when we look at doing focus group surveys interviews we made sure that we went pretty deep into what does everybody have here's the project charter here's what analysis is going to look at but what do you have on projects that you've done over the past decade that would really relate? And so we had the sensation as an organization that we weren't starting from scratch. And that was really helpful because people wanted to go global. They liked the idea of everybody knowing about our programs and having an impact on a global level. They just wanted to make sure that um, we weren't all starting from scratch and that they wouldn't suffer on a loss on, on projects that they felt were really good and that would have a global application. So being global, local trainers are key. You know, once we had a program, Foundations of Leadership, that we could meet with our reports, uh, or the, uh, the reports to our CEO, who led global business units, we could say, look, we've got this and we're ready to go. And if you want to go ahead and make it mandatory, which is what we want, then we could begin to have this kind of impact on all of your leaders worldwide. And a lot of them said, I like the idea but I don't see how it can work because if you look at some of my leaders here in headquarters, they're more likely to be senior leaders. And if you look at, let's say, China, they're more likely to be entry level factory supervisors. And so how do you have that balance? And the answer is local trainers. And that was really key to say, you know, we've got, we've got 25 leadership instructors and we haven't taken a strategy where they're all flying out of headquarters or one city in a particular region, but they're actually part of that site. And so the good news is, is that when we look to say, well, what's an example of change management or what's an example of delegating, that local trainer has gone into that course and every time where we're using an example, they're using an example right from that region or right from a local office so that that person really has the ability to customize the delivery to the people who are in the room. So, you know, we've never said that we don't need local trainers. We absolutely do. And they're really part of a strategy of how do we know that we're teaching locally relevant and with good examples. You know, once we went global, we were able to get um, uh, really tied to our global business strategy. And so when we talk about inspiring leadership and what it looks like, we benefit because we do have a people strategy that defines that, but it's also tied to our global business strategy. Um, it also helped to say who should be in our programs. Um, at first, we looked like everybody was going to our leadership programs, but when we took a closer view, we could see that in Asia, really most of it was individual contributors, about 90%. So the bad news for us is that we really were not reaching leaders. and so to set a global policy and that leadership courses are just for leaders. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't teach leadership concepts for individual contributors. We do, but those are individual contributor classes. Even that alone takes a lot of allegiance and a lot of talking about to come to that agreement worldwide. So, um, but programs can be delivered around the world. Once you're actually teaching the same thing, you get a lot of power. And global programs means global impact. So one of the things that we did, I mentioned our Foundations of Leadership program. 
Uh, we implemented it two years ago, so that means that uh, we're able to take a look at some of the results for the people who went through the first year. And at Dell, we do an annual um, employee satisfaction or engagement survey, and we call it Tell Dell. And uh, on that, we were able to see on the people strategy, one of our categories that I mentioned is inspiring leadership. And so what we were able to do is take a look at what are the results from the people who didn't attend. I told you it was mandatory, and for 81% of the people, they go. We have 19% who are resistors. Uh, they're either, the good news is, is that they take it a year late. So about 12% actually get there. They just had other things to do, maybe legitimately. 7% are really resistors, are probably not going to go for any number of, of, of reasons. And we're working on that. But actually, when you go to do evaluation, it's great. You've got a control group who didn't go. And we also had people who obviously were managers. They hadn't finished the program yet, because it takes some time. And then we had people who had completed the program. And so our goal for inspiring leadership category is we have a number of positive statements. We're looking for about 75% of the employees to agree on the positive side, that they agree with that. Um, positive statement. And so what we were able to see is a significant difference. When we looked at our resistors, people who did not go to the program and people who had completed the program, it was about a seven point difference. So typically for some of our resistors, they were a little bit lower than average, lower than we'd like to see them in the upper 60s and 70s. But on most of the items, about eight items, there was a 7% difference. And so if you look at 5% being statistically significant, we're able to see a real difference. And the interesting thing was is that people who had not completed the program yet, who were in the middle, showed a stair step. So there was a nice progression of showing those who completed the program uh, you know, really had a significant difference in the way that they were perceived by the people who report to them as an inspiring leader. And so that's been really compelling. And so we're hoping to go back to those 19%. Maybe they didn't go because they didn't know what benefits they would get. Uh, and really kind of highlight, hey, this makes a difference. And your people will perceive you differently. And you'll actually probably be doing some of the behaviors that we've talked about. You know, finally, I will have to say it's meant in the end of this journey far more satisfaction for the local trainers. And I'll have to say a real turnaround, which for me is personally satisfying as a leader, when we talked about kind of the loss that it means to be global, locally available, working on many different projects, <clears throat> small, quick projects, versus going to teaching a global curriculum. Everybody likes the idea of the destination, but of course, the journey's kind of hard. And so um, the training teams that are there are you know, very positive about the work that they've done, very proud over the journey that they've went. One, the common standards um, improve training expertise. So when you're looking at writing something that's going to go around the world, the standards go, go up, really to publishing standards. Probably most people on their own or in region weren't necessarily writing materials that you know, could compete with any commercially done project. But certainly, um, even the knowledge of the ADDI model, when you're working with people around the world, you've got to be really clear. So certainly, the perception of what they're able to do, work globally, um, work in a sophisticated way, is far more um, you know, uh, deep as far as training expertise than where they were three years ago. They really value knowing other people in other countries who do the same job role and how they might explain things. You know, we have had some cultural differences in general. Our, our uh, trainers in Asia like a lot of detail. What we've had to do is, is put more detail in the appendix so that our trainers in the US and uh, Latin America and Europe who want kind of a lighter version of the facilitator's guide. So things have evolved, certainly. But um, knowing appears the social side of, of working globally, and that's been really valued. And then finally, the global impact. Everybody wants to work on something that has an impact that's bigger and that's global. And certainly, um, transforming into global teams has done that. And finally, the personal note that you know, global is a skill set and a career builder. You know, the, the truth is, when people walk out now, they probably take a whole bunch of things on global standards, our processes, um, the way that we run our project teams. And so when they walk out the door, they walk out with a completely different skill set. And so they're really an asset to anyone who has a multinational corporation who wants to do a global program. 
they personally have participated in so many projects, the building of the standards, processes, and they know people around the world. So ultimately, it's a very satisfying position and it's a good place to be as you end your journey going from local or regional to global. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Frank.